Ephesians chapter number six. Um, there's a couple of us men that have been going through a, a series, and uh, it's a series of videos that we are helping uh, Falls Baptist Church to test out that they are putting together, and I'll be, I've talked to you about it already. It's, it's a, a purity series, and um, they are in the stages now where they have it in rough draft form. They have it ready, and uh, they have asked a couple of different churches to um, help them go through it and go through it as if you know, it was all finished and then give them feedback on it. So we're a part of that, our church is, and I've asked a couple of guys to join me in that, and we're limited in the number that we can do in this, in this kind of pilot group is what they call it, so there's only a couple of guys, but uh, we've been going through it, and one of the things that was mentioned in one of the videos was the fact that Satan is a great enemy. Of course, we know that, but the pastor in the video mentioned something that's very, very true, and as he mentioned it, it stood out to me, and I knew that we didn't have uh, any any other message to go through in Colossians on Wednesday night, now that we're done with that. And I felt like the Lord was impressing upon my heart for us to go over this topic. And the topic is that Satan is a great enemy and that Christians often don't consider how great an enemy he is. That we often just kind of live our lives as if he's not that big of a deal. And uh, sin is a big deal, we know that, but we don't often think of the fact that there is someone behind, not only sin, but behind a lot of the battles that we face. And uh, Satan is an enemy that we ought to be aware of, and the Word of God is clear on that. It's not our text verse, but 1 Peter 5, 8 says that we should uh, be sober and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. So we ought to be sober and vigilant. But Ephesians 6 and verse 12 is another passage of Scripture that I uh, wanted to share with you. Notice what it says, Ephesians 6, 12, and this is our text verse. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But of course, our wrestling is against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. And then notice that last phrase, our our wrestling is against spiritual wickedness in high places. The title of the message is Informational Warfare. Informational Warfare, because that's really what we are uh, facing. That's the type of battle that we are in with Satan. It is a battle for information. And uh, we've already prayed, we've asked God to help us, but I tell you what, I think it would be good just one more time to go before him. Lord. Would you guide us now? Please, Lord. Again, we've already asked, but I feel the impression, Lord, to ask you again to allow the truth of your word to go forth and to help people tonight, your people. Lord, that you would awaken each of us to the fact that we have an enemy who is real, who's working hard. Help us to learn of his tactics, not so that we can focus on him, but that we can focus on you and your word as the means to defeat him. And Lord, I ask that you would enable us in that. And I pray that you would rebuke him and Lord, that your spirit would be, in, uh, or would be able to move and work here in this service tonight with free reign by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I ask. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. By way of introduction, I want to give you an introduction and then I'll just give you three points, all right? So by way of introduction, the first thing I would have you notice is something that I'm assuming you're already aware of, but that is that God is a spirit. God is a spirit. The Bible tells us that. John 4 and verse 24, the Lord Jesus said to the woman at the well, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. And because of that, God's working in this world is by his spirit. Think about it. I realize that God uses the local church and God does use people who are uh, uh, real and physical people to do his work, but really all of that even is working under the power of, if it's right anyway, his spirit. To the point where in Zechariah 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. 
That's how God works in this world. It is by His Spirit. And what does God's Spirit do in this world? I want you to catch this. This is important because we're going to focus on how we have an enemy and the enemy uses similar tactics but from the opposite angle, okay? First of all, God's Spirit speaks and promotes truth. That's God's working in this world. By His Spirit, He speaks and promotes truth, which we have in His Word, right? It's authored by the Spirit of God, and of course, He even illuminates it and helps us to understand it. Also, God's Spirit convicts the Christian, specifically, away from sin. God's Spirit is a gift to us to convict us away from sin. <clears throat> Aren't you glad that we have the Spirit of God? Where would we be without the Spirit of God? That's even kind of a foolish question to ask, isn't it? Because we have the Spirit. We don't even know what it would be like without the Spirit of God. But think about the many times that you've fallen into sin and many times you've been tempted to sin, and yet God has by His Spirit restrained you. Have you ever been in a situation where you were tempted to sin and maybe it was a sin that was something that was a uh, uh, what we would consider a major sin or one that would really ruin your testimony, one that would really uh, inhibit you from being all that God wanted you to be, and the Spirit of God was strong upon you saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, to the point where you could not stay in that sin. I can tell you, I have had that more times than I can even tell you, that God's Spirit has been so good to convict me away from sin. I'm thankful for His Spirit. Also, God's Spirit promotes health and healing. God's Spirit promotes health and healing. We don't talk about that much, but the Lord Jesus Christ went about healing people, didn't he? The apostles in the early days healed people, and both the Lord Jesus as well as the apostles did all of that in the power of the Spirit. The Spirit of God promotes health and healing. When we are led by the Spirit of God, do you realize that we promote health in our bodies? If I'm walking in the Spirit, then I won't do things that are detrimental to my health. I'll live a well-balanced life that I realize we live in a sin-cursed world and we're all going to die someday, all right? But if I'm walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to be, you know, smoking three packs a day. You say, well, duh, Pastor. But wait a minute. I won't be drinking. I won't be overeating. I won't be overworking. If I'm led by the Spirit of God, I'll live a balanced life. He promotes health and healing. God works that way in this world. But that leads us to this, that, listen, Satan also is a spirit. Think about that. Satan also is a spirit. Now, he's not an eternal spirit. God is the eternal spirit. But Satan is also a spiritual being. He is a created spiritual being. God created him. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ created all things. That includes Satan. But Satan is also a spirit, and Satan's working in this world is also a spiritual working. Just as God works in a spiritual way, Satan works in a spiritual way. Now, again, it's the opposite, isn't it? Just as when God speaks and promotes truth, what does Satan do? He speaks and promotes lies. God's Spirit convicts away from sin. Satan's Spirit tempts to sin. God's Spirit promotes health and healing. Satan's Spirit promotes death. And he works towards sickness and death. But Satan's working in this world is also spiritual. Turn with me, if you would, over to uh, Mark chapter number 3, and stay with me now, okay? Mark chapter number 3, I want you to see this. The Lord Jesus even referenced this as he was ministering. Now, Mark chapter 3, as you can imagine, is early in Jesus' ministry. Mark chapter 3 and verse 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, speaking of Jesus, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. Because again, Jesus was casting out devils or the spirits, the fallen angels, that work under Satan's control. Verse 23, And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? 
And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. Now notice verse 27. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Jesus was referencing what he was doing when he was casting out devils. He was binding the strong man so that he could spoil his goods. That before Jesus could do his work, he had to bind the wicked one. Because the wicked one, Satan, was working against him in spiritual ways. And because of that, the Lord Jesus Christ had to begin his ministry by casting out devils. Because the devils, the spirits that work under Satan's control, work on a person in spiritual ways. Now, that's by way of introduction. Let's now talk about these three points. The first one being the working of spirits. What tactics do they use? That's point number one, the working of spirits. Well, the first thing they use is physical warfare. We don't talk about this much, but Satan does use physical warfare sometimes. He uses pain to attempt, God's, to attempt to cause God's people to curse him. We don't have time to look at the life of Job, but you know the story of Job. Job was a man who feared God and eschewed, or that means he, he hated, he despised, he didn't want anything to do with that which was evil. He eschewed evil. And God brought that up before Satan when Satan was there. And Satan said, well, God, if you let me touch him, he's going to curse you to your face. And of course, God allowed Satan to do that. And when Job wouldn't do it the first time, then Satan said about Job, well, let me, let, let me deal with him even further. And when I really give him pain, then he's going to curse you to your face. And of course, it didn't work. But that was Satan's attempt. He used pain and physical suffering to cause God's people to curse him or to try to cause God's people to curse him. You realize that Satan sometimes does that. Some of the pain, some of the suffering that you and I go through could be directly from Satan, where Satan is trying to get us to quit on God. And sadly, some Christians do quit on God when things go south with their health. Now, the beautiful thing about the narrative of the story of Job is that that suffering was only within the limits of what God said and the moment that God said that the captivity of Job was to be turned around, it was turned around. It was all under God's control. So we need not fear the devil. We need not worry about, oh, I think the devil's going to get one over on me, and I'm really trying to serve God now, and so, oh man, Satan's going to be all over me, and I'm going to be sick and in bed and uh, you know, hardly able to move and all of that. Listen, that's not, that's not the right attitude and, and outlook on things. Satan can do nothing to you that God does not allow so stop being so afraid of Satan and using it as an excuse to not serve God. Satan is under God's control, but he does use pain sometimes to try to attempt to cause God's people to curse him. God uses this pain for good. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Do you believe that? I know you know the verse. I know you know it's true. But do you believe it, that all things really do work together for good? They do. Let me show you some areas where this pain that Satan is allowed to bring into our lives, God actually uses it for good. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12, because in 2 Corinthians 12, we have the, um, the testimony of the Apostle Paul as he suffered pain and suffering under Satan's hand. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> Verse number 7. <clears throat> the apostle in the beginning of the chapter talks about how he had been allowed to see just marvelous things in heavenly places. Verse 7, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So here we have the Apostle Paul being afflicted by a messenger of Satan. My understanding, that word messenger is the same word that we would also translate sometimes in English, angel. It's, it's a 
power of the devil that is allowed to afflict me, or in this case, Paul, in a certain way. And Paul was suffering from this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. There's some conjecture about, and I tend to think it was probably a major eye issue that he had that was a weakness in his life. And it was a messenger of Satan that was there to buffet him. The idea of buffet being uh, someone who is in front of you with their uh, fists clenched and they're you know, pounding your face with their fists. And that's what Satan was allowed to do. But I want you to notice a couple of things about this. First of all, God used that pain for good. He used it, first of all, to keep Paul from pride. And you realize that God will give you sometimes sickness and allow Satan to give you sickness and heart, heartache and pain and physical ailments to keep you from pride. You're like, but pastor, I don't need to be kept from pride. I'm humble. Yeah, some of you got that joke, right? It's like I was talking to Abigail today and we were talking about my, uh, my church ed teacher, which Lord willing, by the way, in June, he's gonna be with us on Father's Day weekend and I hope you'll be here on Father's Day weekend to hear uh, Pastor Tim Young You'll enjoy hearing him. He's a sought-after preacher, and he was my church head teacher all four years in Bible college. But he used to say, anyone who says, I'm a perfectionist, is not a perfectionist. Because when you think you're a perfectionist, then you're not really a perfectionist. And you know that sometimes when we think we're humble, we're really the most prideful ones. When we say, oh, uh, I think I got the humility thing down. Well, the Apostle Paul recognized that this messenger of Satan was there to buffet him. And it was buffeting him to keep him from pride. God will use that in your life to keep you from pride. And all of us need that. But look at verse number eight. There was another thing that God did. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. What else did the messenger of Satan do for the Apostle Paul? It drove him to his knees. It caused him to pray. And you know that God will sometimes put you in a position where you have physical pain and he'll allow the devil to buffet you on some things because he wants to drive you to your knees. That's a good thing. He wants you to pray. The truth of the matter is that when we are not in pain and when everything is going right, it is so easy for us to forget to pray. When the bank account is somewhat full and the doctor's visits aren't scary, and uh, you know the car is working the way that it should, oh, I know that never happens. <laughs> Cars always are giving problems, right? But when things are more or less okay, we often don't pray. But God will allow this pain that comes from Satan to drive us to our knees. And then verses 9 and 10 show us, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I would encourage you to read verses 9 and 10 on your own. But the third thing about this pain that Satan brings that God uses for good is that it makes us strong in Christ. Because when we are weak in him, then we are strong. When we are weak in the flesh, we are, we are forced to rely on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's where the real strength is. So how do spirits work? What tactics do they use? Well, first of all, they do use sometimes physical warfare, and we've talked about that. But here's the main thing that they use. The main thing that they use is the title of our message, informational warfare. How is Satan going to work in your life? Christian, are you aware of Satan? Are you being sober? Are you living in a sober manner in your life? Are you aware that Satan is going to work against you? I trust that you are, and here's how he's going to work against you. More than he's going to worry about whether or not you're suffering pain and affliction, he's going to try to beat you with informational warfare. And here's how he'll do that. First of all, he will promote lies. John 8, 44, Jesus said this about Satan. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan is a liar. And he's going to try to bring lies to your life. Boy, we could go on and on about lies that Satan brings. There's so many. They're innumerable. But that's his main tactic. These lies will often make sense to the human mind. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8. These lies will often make sense to the human mind. 
be careful that you try that you don't try to use logic to understand everything that the Word of God says. It's not that God wants you to turn your brain off. He doesn't. But He doesn't want you to rely upon logic either. Colossians 2 and verse number 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, that's man's wisdom, and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Those lies that Satan will use to try to spoil you will often make sense to the human mind. They'll be logical, but they're logical lies. Do you realize that sometimes the things that make sense are a lie? It makes sense to me that I would have to do something good to save myself from my sin, but that's a lie. It makes sense to me that God would never condescend from His glory in heaven to take on the form of flesh to become sin for me and die in my place and give me his righteousness. That makes no sense to me that he would, and it makes every sense to me that he would not do that. And yet, it's a lie to think that he wouldn't, because he did. You understand, we cannot use logic to understand God's truth. Satan will try to promote lies to you that will make sense. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. There's another thing about these lies that he will bring to us in this informational warfare, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse 13. Not only will these lies make sense to the human mind at times, at many times they will also appear to be light. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Oftentimes, those lies that Satan brings forth, they are robed in what appears to be light. And that's Satan's main tactic. But now look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Here's something that's even a little more dangerous about those lies. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the, next three words say, working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Did you notice there that Satan will work in such a way that he will even, and this is talking specifically about the man of sin, here called that wicked, that when he's revealed, he will have the ability by Satan's power to have signs and lying wonders. So there will be miracles that will happen through his word, that are empowered by Satan to try to deceive people. And of course, those who don't love the truth will be deceived. But do you see there that Satan, his main tactic is informational warfare. Sometimes it will appear like it's light. Sometimes it will make sense to the human mind. Sometimes as well, it will even be uh, accompanied by miracles. But don't be deceived. Here's another way that Satan works with informational warfare. Not only does he promote lies, but... Turn with me, if you would, please, to um, Mark chapter number 4. Here's another thing that he will do. And parents, I would ask you to pay very close attention to this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at, Mark chapter 4 and verse 15. Here's another thing that Satan will do since his main working is in informational warfare. Not only does he promote lies... But Mark chapter 4 and verse 15, this is the parable of the sower and the seed. And these are they by the wayside. Remember, some of the seed was cast and it fell on the wayside. Where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. That verse teaches us that one of Satan's tactics is to quickly snatch away the word when it falls on the heart of somebody who's on the wayside. When the soil is not prepared, 
when it's not ready to receive the seed of the word of God, Satan is right there to snatch the word away. And the re reason that I mentioned that, parents, I need you to pay attention to that, is Satan will try to do that with your children. They'll come and they'll be in Sunday school or they'll be in church and they'll be uh, you, you know, in, in some form of, uh, of Bible teaching. Maybe it'll be even your devotional time at home and all of that. And you'll give them the truth of God's word. But if you're not careful, what you do is when you allow them, let's just say you leave the church service here and immediately you go home and they're just watching foolishness on television before they go to bed. I'm not saying that every time you should never allow that to happen. I'm just saying that could be a way that Satan is snatching the word from the hearts of your children to get them caught up in foolishness when God is trying to work on their hearts. And it might be, you know, on the way home, there's uh, just frivolous talk or uh, maybe, I, I don't think anyone here would do this, but maybe even backbiting against the pastor or other members or something like that. And it's a, a way for Satan to snatch away the seed of the word of God that's been planted in the heart of your little ones. Let's be careful about those things. And remember, that's one of Satan's tactics. Don't let him do it. Give that seed time to sink in. And then, of course, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Here's another way that Satan works with informational warfare. Matthew chapter 4. Not only does he promote lies and snatch away the truth, but in Matthew 4, 1, we see something else that he does. This, again, is early in Jesus' ministry, actually before his ministry ever begins, it says, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Satan tempts us toward sin. And how does he do that? Well, he, with information. He'll come to us and he'll put something before us that sin, whether it be a um, uh, you know, temptation toward a lust of the flesh, or maybe it is a temptation to uh, be involved in anger or unforgiveness or gossip, or boy, we could list a hundred different sins, couldn't we? He, he'll, he'll bring that to us, and he'll tempt us toward sin. And he's going to work in your life and my life. Some thought's going to come up in your mind. Maybe it will be somebody, you know, somebody didn't look at me just the right way in the service. I know that never happens to you. Somebody walked by me quickly instead of shaking my hand. Boy, something must be wrong, and they probably don't like me. Listen, that's Satan. That's informational warfare. That's Satan trying to get into your heart and divide between you and a brother or you and a sister. That's a tactic of Satan. Or the pastor said something in the message and he was really thinking of me when he said that. Now listen, you have no idea what the pastor's thinking when he's preaching. He doesn't even know. Most of the time he's thinking of sandwiches, okay? But listen, as, as, some, as some pastors have said in the past, listen, I've got enough to worry about to try to always, you know, worry about uh, nailing you in every message I preach. But Satan will put thoughts in your mind about, oh, the pastor's really talking about me when he says this, or he's singling me out, or whatever it might be. Listen, that's a lie from Satan. That's informational warfare. And Satan will do that. He'll tempt you towards sin and whatever it might be. And I would encourage you to be aware of that. Now let's move on because we're kind of running out of time here. We've seen the working of spirits, the tactics that they use. Let's look at the ignorance of Christians. The ignorance of Christians. That's point number two. We are ignorant of these things because we are ignorant of God's Word. We are ignorant of these things because we are ignorant of God's Word. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11 says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Well, we're not ignorant of his devices if we're in God's word. In other words, the opportunity to not be ignorant of his devices is found right here. But when I'm saved, if I never get into the word of God and I never get into a church that preaches the word of God, I'm going to be ignorant of his devices. But we are ignorant often of how Satan works and spirits work because we are ignorant of God's word. And Christians, I want to encourage you as much as possible. And I, I know, believe me, I know it is difficult. And I know we live in a busy world. But friends, I cannot stress to you enough the importance of you getting into a habit of reading God's word daily. There is nothing more important for you outside of obviously being saved and 
being a member of a good local church and all of that, but maybe even before being a member of a good local church, the importance would be get into God's Word. Satan wants to keep you from that. And I realize you say, life is busy. Hey, I know. Life is busy for everyone. And yet, friends, we have time for what we want to have time for. That's not good English, but it's true. We do choose the things that are important to us. Last time I checked, Netflix and Hulu and you know, YouTube TV were not going out of business anytime soon. Why? Because every American says they're busy, but every American has time to binge watch Netflix. And yet every American, every American talks about, I'm busy. That's hogwash. Because again, we choose things all the time that are extra that we do. And I know I'm being a little hard on you here, but it's time to grow up and get a habit of being in God's Word. Because we have a real, literal devil who is main tactic is informational warfare, and God gave you the way to defeat that informational warfare, this book. And it's a tragedy and a travesty and a crime to not be in his word on a regular basis. So I want to encourage you to not be ignorant of God's word. But the other reason that we're ignorant of these things is because we're carnal, if we're honest. And I'm preaching it myself as much as anybody. We are carnal. We know more about the world's music, the world's television, movies, sports, activities. We know more about these things than we do God's word. We're carnal. That's why we're ignorant of these things, and we love this world. 1 John 2, verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We're ignorant of these things because we're carnal. We know more about the world's things than we do his word. We love this world. And then we are asleep as if we walked in darkness. Christians today are asleep. And I know we're not asleep when it comes to political things. And by the way, I'm not against that. I, I follow politics as well, okay? I think it's good to follow politics and be aware of who to vote for. That's not bad, okay? I'm not picking on that, but sometimes we're more aware of those things than we are of Satan and his working. And we're asleep in this world as if, as if nothing around us all that important is going on. And then the other reason that we're ignorant of these things is not only because we're ignorant of God's word and we're carnal, but Satan hides well. Satan is astute at hiding. And then let me go to point number three, the last point here, the battle plan for us. We've seen the working of spirits, the ignorance of Christians, and now the battle plan for us. First of all, we must put on the whole armor of God. How are you going to defeat Satan in his informational warfare? Well, first of all, you must put on the whole armor of God. We don't have time to go over it, but Ephesians 6, you know the list, verses 12 through 17, right? The helmet of salvation, the uh, loins girt about with truth, and the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, all of those things, the sword of the Spirit, right? The helmet of salvation, all of those things that you and I are to put on. If we are going to defeat Satan, the first thing we have to do is put on the armor of God. And again, may I remind you that every one of those parts of the armor have something to do with God's Word, every one of them. They're all based in this book. So again, get in the book. That is your opportunity to defeat Satan when he is battling against you in inform informational warfare. And then also we must battle spiritually. So not only must we put on the armor of God, but when we go out to battle, we have to battle spiritually, not physically. In other words, we have to confront men with the word of God. And we have to confront the lies that Satan brings to us with the word of God. What does God's word say? I don't understand it all the time, but I do know that God says in his word that if we resist the devil and we submit ourselves to God, that Satan will flee from us. And I noticed that when Jesus was tempted to turn the stones into bread, which doesn't seem like much of a big crime to me, but it obviously did to the Lord because it was doing something outside of the commands of the Father. 
It was doing something good at the wrong time. And how did Jesus defeat Satan's lies? Thus it is written, right? It is written. Here's what the Bible says. This is what Scripture says. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that was enough to cause Satan to stop that part of the temptation. And he moved on to another one. And Jesus again responded with, here's what the word of God says. Boom. And Satan moved on. So what do I need to do when Satan comes against me with informational warfare? Whether I'm dealing with somebody else and trying to help them or whether Satan is coming against me, I need to be in the word of God and say, no, here is what God's word says. And stand upon God's word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Right? It is a sword that God wants us to use. And then the second part of that, that as far as battling spiritually in this world, is we need to battle in prayer. We need to battle for others in prayer, and we need to battle for ourselves in prayer. When we are faced with Satan's darts and arrows and his informational warfare, or we're dealing with others who are, we need to pray for them. We need to be in prayer constantly because only God can open their eyes. Only God can use his word to help them, and only God can use his word to help us as well. Prayer is our weapon and God's word. I hope that is a help to you in regards to the fact that you and I are to be aware of Satan being a real enemy and he's working hard. Will he use physical things? Yes. But God turns those for our good. But Satan's big tactic is informational warfare. Don't let him win. Get in God's word and pray. Let's go to the Lord together. Father, thank you for the time that we've had. I do pray, Lord, that you would bless this message and especially the preaching of your word, the reminding of what your word says. Bless it to the hearts of your people. Lord, help us all to remember that Satan is around us. He's constantly using um, lies and tactics of information, whether negative or positive, uh, to try to defeat us. Lord, I pray that you'd give us victory. Help us to be people of your word. Help us to be people of prayer. Lord, begin with me. This man right behind the pulpit, Lord, I am in need of this more than anybody. Lord, I pray that you would help me to learn this. And then, Lord, help me to teach others as well. And I thank you that you are. I sense and see your working in that. I give you glory and honor and praise. Thank you for that. Please continue that great work. In Jesus' name, amen.